for years I have been denouncing political correctness. For years I have been warning people across America that political correctness is aiding and abetting the advance of radical Islam on our soil. I launched Act for America because I realized we must come together to mobilize the nation, to educate the nation, to make a difference. And at this point of my presentation, I want to move about why I'm so concerned about the education system in our country and what's happening, how the radicals right now are trying to brainwash the children in our country. And this is why we are seeing a rise of homegrown terrorism. People wonder, how can we in the last two years have arrested over 75 homegrown terrorists, all Muslims, either born into the Islamic faith or have converted to Islam, trying to attack United States or carry terrorist attacks against America? over 75 homegrown terrorists. How did this happen? How did these good people, good Americans, some of them born as Baptists and raised as Baptists like Bledsoe here in Nashville, how can these people become so radicalized to the point where they are hating our country so much they are willing to die to kill Americans? And I'm going to shift right now as to what's happening in this country in education. We talked a lot, about, a lot today about Sharia and the threat of Sharia and our court system, what's happening militarily. We know that they want to attack us. We know they are advancing Sharia and what Sharia is all about. But here is what's happening on the educational level and how they are trying to change our society culturally from within in order to destroy our society. And I'm going to begin with what's happening on college campuses with the infiltration of our country. I call our universities right now occupied territories. People ask me, what's happening with the universities, especially if you have a child in, your, in a university? People in the heartland pinch pennies, save their money, eat peanut butter and jelly sandwiches so they can send their children to college to get an education, to have the American dream, only to find out they're sending them to the lion's den. The children come back home, they are completely changed, they loathe America, they do not like America, they're apologizing for America, and you wonder what happened to my children. Here's what happened to your children. You see, there is an Islamic agenda that has been in operation for a very long time. And you have heard today the Muslim Brotherhood mentioned and a lecture about the Muslim Brotherhood. What's been happening with the universities, with the education system, is because of the oil wealth in the Middle East, the Muslims have been able to pour millions of dollars into our universities, setting up Middle East study department and political science department, and appointing Arab professors who are anti-America and anti-Israel, who are brainwashing our students into believing America is bad, Israel is evil, and uh, we've got, you know, they are embarrassed and apologizing for the country. Here is the extent of the Saudi peddling that has taken place in our country. King Fahed of Saudi Arabia has donated $20 million to set up a Middle East study department at the University of Arkansas. $5 million donated to Berkeley's Middle East, uh, Middle East department from two Saudi sheikhs linked to Al-Qaeda. Harvard received $22.5 million. $28.1 million went to Georgetown. $11 million went to Cornell. 5 million went to MIT, 1.5 million to Texas A&M, 1 million to Princeton. Rutgers received 5 million share endowment, as did Columbia, who tried to lie to conceal the source of the fund. Other recipients of Saudi tainted monies include UC Santa Barbara, John Hopkins University, Rice University, American University, University of Chicago, USC, UCLA, Duke University, Syracuse University, Howard University, and many, many others. I can go on and on, you get the picture. From the Ivy League to the community colleges and everything in between, we pump the gas and they pump poison into the hearts and minds of our future generation. And this is why we must become energy independent and cut off the money thing to the Saudi. The way they're doing it is they're using a loophole called Title VI program, which was started by our government after World War II to educate American students about foreign cultures and foreign languages so they may be an asset to our country, especially those who want to get into the diplomatic field and work for the State Department. This is how they are able to get this money into our universities. And this is why, when you look at the news and at the media and the mainstream media and you think to yourself, why is the media so biased? Why can't they see what we see? 
The reason why is because for the last 16 years, all these students graduating out of our Ivy League colleges who have been fed a steady diet of resentment against America and against Israel are today the bureau chiefs, the news writers, the news anchors, the news reporters who are reporting on these things. We shouldn't be surprised. They are the opinion shapers and makers. Unfortunately, they do not realize how they get to this point of thinking this way. The problem does not stop there. The radical Islamic agenda in the country thought the strategy worked so well on college campus, why wait until the kids get to college? Why don't we start educating the children when they are in middle school? So the Council on Islamic Education started advising America's book publishers on how to portray Islam in public schools. They started uh, uh, consulting with Houghton Mifflin and McGraw-Hill and Random House who write the social studies books and the history books on how to teach Islam in the public school system. They're doing exactly what Hitler did. What did Hitler say? What did Hitler do? Give me the children. I'll change society in 10 years. And for those of you who have been watching what's happening, the attitude of the youth of America against America, you are seeing the results of years of education, of the radical agenda happening in our educational system, and years of apathy on our part, sitting on the sidelines and not paying attention how we're losing our universities and our schools. Here's what's happening with the public school system. They started now teaching a course on Islam in seventh grade. The course is a three-week course where Johnny and Sally have to adopt Muslim names, become Muslims for three weeks, memorize and recite verses from the Quran, fast for Ramadan if they can for one day to experience what it's like to be a Muslim, and then go to a mosque on a field trip. Here's what the course says. You know, before when I would speak about these things, people would say to me, absolutely baloney. This could not be happening. We have separation and church, of state, church, state, and, church and state in this country. So I decided there is nothing like show and tell. So here is the course. It is the course of Islam. So here's how the course started. And before I start, by the way, don't get me wrong. I want my children to be educated about Christianity, Judaism, Buddhism, Islam. I want my kids to get an all-rounded education about all religions. But let me do the nitty-gritty at home in my own home when I want to teach them about what my kids want to learn. So here's how the course starts. The course starts with the teacher giving instructions to the students about the class. From the beginning, you and your classmates will become Muslims. You will be a member of a caravan. The teacher instructions continue. Dressing as, Muslim, as a Muslim and trying to be involved will increase your learning and enjoyment. Finally, trying your best in all tasks will guarantee you an excellent grade and a more enjoyable time. The teacher is already dangling the great carrot in front of the children. Here are the list of Islamic names that the children have to choose from. Abdullah, Khalid, Hassan, Hamza, Ibrahim, Arafat, Kharija, Maryam, Noor, Amina, etc. Here are what they called wisdom cards, which is exercise cards that the children have to study at school, just like they study with math cards or whatever, in order for them to understand their lessons. This card that I'm going to use as an example in particular, and there's many of them pages upon pages, but it talks about jihad. Because jihad has become a word that we are all very familiar with, we have heard a lot, because every terrorist that either blew himself up or committed suicide or martyrdom or uh, w w did a video of his last rite before he blows himself up, he talks about jihad fi sabilillah. He is dying in the path of Allah. Here's what they're teaching our students about jihad. A jihad is a struggle by Muslims against oppression, invasion, and injustice. This is a fact card. Now, if these words sound familiar to you, it's because they are the talking points of Al-Qaeda and the Palestinian Authority and Hamas or whatever, every time they talk about why they're fighting the West, why they're fighting America, they are fighting injustice, they are fighting oppression, they are fighting invasion. Our children in seventh grade in public schools in the United States right now are being taught the talking points of our enemies as facts in our public schools and we the taxpayers are paying for it.
And by the way, the word jihad is mentioned in the Quran 40 times, 36 times out of 40 as a war, as a holy war against the infidels to either kill them or subjugate them. So the kids are taught flat lies. And here's a kicker some of you will appreciate, especially it's amazing that we're doing this at church. Here is the Shahada or the Islamic salvation prayer when uh, somebody wants to convert to Islam and wants to become a Muslim. This is what they say. It is the equivalent to uh, the Christian prayer of I accept Jesus into my heart as my Lord and Savior, etc. Here's what the kids have to analyze in the classroom. They have to analyze this prayer. In the name of Allah, the compassionate, the merciful. Praise be to Allah, Lord of creation. The compassionate, the merciful, King of Judgment Day. You alone we worship, and to you alone we pray for help. Guide us to the straight path, the path of those whom you have favored, not of those who have incurred your wrath, which is the Jews, nor of those who have gone astray, which is the atheists and the Christians. Can you imagine if the pastor here goes to a school, to a public school, and says, Hey, y'all, we're going to study the Bible for three weeks. You are going to have Judeo-Christian names like Michael and Sarah, and we're going to memorize and recite verses from the Bible, and you're going to try to fast for one day to experience Good Friday or Yom Kippur, so you'll know what it's like to, to come from that heritage, and then you're going to come on Sunday to church service to experience what it's like to be a Muslim. Can you imagine what would happen to that pastor? Hell will break loose. The ACLU will scream up in arms. Again, I am all for religious education at school, but this is indoctrination and it's unacceptable. This is exactly why we have separation between church and state. Do not mix the two together. Here is some of the exercises in the class as well. Become a Muslim warrior during the Crusades or during an ancient Jihad. Explain weapons, tactics, etc. Excuse me? This is a class exercise? And we are sitting here being, everybody is afraid to say anything lest we offend somebody? I believe political correctness needs to be thrown in the garbage where it belongs and start calling the spade a spade. Yeah, I'm talking to the right people. What made America great is people like us who came from all over the world to become Americans. Your great-grandparents, your grandparents, your parents, or yourself if you are a first-generation immigrant like me. We are a melting pot. If you look across this room, you'll see a tapestry of different colors, different backgrounds, different heritage, different religion, different everything. But we came all together here to be Americans. So we can love this country. So we can be free. We have all our shortcomings. No country is great. But we all work together and come together to make sure we protect and we secure this country and keep it as a beacon of light to those people coming from the rest of the world so they can enjoy what we all enjoyed, whether we are a first generation immigrant or not. And I say to those people who criticize America, who hate America, who think so ill of America, if America is so bad, by all means, we'll give you a one-way ticket and go out and go to whatever country you choose and leave it to us. <laughs> no one is perfect. We all have our shortcomings. But we all have to take care of our home and our family. And that's the people of the United States and this great country that our founding fathers have set up for us. People come here speaking different languages, different nationalities. I am sick and tired when I hear people say, I'm an African American and I'm a Japanese American and I'm Italian American. I am nothing but an American. And unless we get back to that point, we're going to lose our country. And while I'm on a roll, English is the official language of the United States and shall remain so. When people hear about the Middle East, they think all the, the countries in the Middle East are Muslim countries. This was not the case 30 years ago. Lebanon was the only majority Christian country in the Middle East. Lebanon was the most westernized modern country in the Middle East. 
When we got our independence from France in the early 40s, the majority of the population were Christian, the Muslims were the minority. We prospered, we built the country, we are the descendants of the Phoenicians, we were good in commerce, and in a very short period of time, Lebanon became Paris of the Middle East, the banking capital of the Middle East. We had the best universities in the Middle East, the best education centers, the best schools, the best theaters. We exported the theater and the art to the rest of the Arabic world. That's why a lot of Arabic countries understand the Lebanese dialect through our culture, but while we do not understand many of theirs. We had open borders. We were a very multicultural society. We allowed people to come into our country freely and study in our country. They usually graduated and stayed there because our country offered them the best economic um, uh, perspective for a job in the Middle East, even though we didn't have any oil. That was Lebanon. The situation began to change gradually as the Muslims started growing and becoming more than 50% of society. We, the Christians, do not multiply as much, while the Muslims, a lot of them, are allowed to marry up to four wives at a time. This is how they multiplied. We started shrinking, they started growing. The most famous Muslim in the world today is Osama bin Laden. Osama bin Laden is one out of 53 children. He himself has 27 children. Between father and son, they have produced 80 children. This is what tipped the scale in the Middle East over the years. And one, we always had our problem controlled with the Muslims until the influx of the Palestinians out of Jordan when King Hussein kicked them out of Jordan in Black September. And actually, King Hussein killed more Palestinians in Black September than the state of Israel has killed in all its existence. Lebanon, not surprisingly, being a country based on Judeo-Christian values with open borders and multicultural uh, attitude, took the Palestinians in. We were the only country in the Middle East who took the Palestinians in for the third wave of refugees in 1970. Once they came in, they put their heads together with the radical Islamists in our country and declared holy war on the Christians. Yasser Arafat tried to establish in Lebanon a base from which to attack Israel, something he tried to do in Jordan and failed because of the Jordanian dictatorship by the king. Yet he was able to do it in Lebanon using our laws, our multiculturalism, our tolerance, and our open-mindedness against us. The problem worsened by 1974. Christians became prisoners to their homes and towns. We stopped traveling. I would ask my parents, how come we're not going to Beirut this year for Christmas? Because the rest of my family lived in Beirut. And my father would give me an excuse, well, we decided to stay home this year. The reason why we stopped traveling is because the Muslims and the Palestinians would set up checkpoints and would stop cars driving. And they would look at the people's IDs. And in Lebanon, as in throughout the Middle East, our religion is identified on our ID. You are either a Christian, a Muslim, or a Jew. So when the Palestinians and the Muslims would stop the car and see that this family is a Christian family, they would get them out of the car and shoot them in cold blood. It was called identity killing at the time. We stopped traveling. That's why we became prisoners. By 1975, the Palestinians and the Muslims formed an army called Jaish Lebanon al-Arabi, the Arabic Lebanese army, and started taking over the military bases and destroying the Lebanese infrastructure and attacking the Lebanese government institutions. The army base above my house in South Lebanon was the last army base left in the country in the hands of the Lebanese army. This was in 1975. They grouped their people together and in trying to take over the military base in my town, they bombed my home bringing it down and burying me under the rubble. This was in 1975. I was wounded. I ended up in a hospital for two and a half months and undergone surgeries. And I would ask my parents, why did they do this to us? And my father would tell me, because we are Christians. The Muslims consider us infidels. So I learned at a very young age, at age 10 years old, that I am wanted dead simply because I was born into the Christian faith. I left the hospital and I came home, and my home was no longer the home I left. I ended up living in a bomb shelter, underground, with no electricity, no water, and very little food. To get some water, we would crawl to a nearby spring under sniper's bullets, my mother and I in a ditch, 
and we would get to the spring, and my mother had to use the stocking on top of the bottle of water to catch all the worms and all the rocks and all the maggots so we can drink the water. And then we would crawl back to the bomb shelter. Before we left, every time we would say our last goodbyes because we did not know if we're going to be if we're going to come back alive or dead. We didn't have any food. My mother finally crawled up to our uh, uh, storage place and brought down rice, dried rice, and dried lentils and dried chickpeas, and she would soak them overnight so we can eat. And this was the food we lived on. The only greenery we had to eat was the grass that grew around our bomb shelter. I would crawl out under the bombs and I would dig grass out. And I learned how to peel the thorn so I can eat the stalk with my ripe hands of 12 years old so I can eat the green stalk inside the thorn. That was the only greenery we ate. We had no heat. We would freeze. We are in the mountains. We are with, next to the border of Israel. My father had to light, uh, break twigs from trees and pour kerosene and benzene on them in the middle of our bomb shelter, our 8 by 10 room where we lived underground. And many times we would cuddle around the fire, and many times we would fall asleep, and we had an agreement. Whoever woke up first would drag the other two outside and slap them on their face to wake up because of carbon monoxide poisoning. We would pass out. This was my life. Meanwhile, we were surrounded by the Palestinians and the Muslims who want to slaughter us. And we knew what our fate was going to be because we knew what they were doing to the Christian towns in Lebanon as they overtaken the country. They... People that have fled from the rest of Lebanon who came to our area would tell us what they were doing in the other parts of Lebanon. One of the main famous massacres is the massacre of the Moor. They massacred many Christians. They would walk into a bomb shelter, meaning the Islamists and the Palestinians. They would find the family hiding in a bomb shelter. They would find the mother and a father with a little baby. They would take the baby, tie one leg of the baby to the mother and another leg to the father and pull the parents apart, splitting the child in half. They would walk into our churches, urinate and defecate on the altar using the Bibles as toilet paper. The last lady that worked for me was completely mentally disturbed. I hired her so I can take care of her and her family. They tied her to a chair. They tied her 16-year-old son on her lap, held a knife to her hand, and made her behead him before they raped her two daughters in front of her. I think the biggest disservice the American media did to the American public is not show them the beheading of Daniel Pearl and Nick Berg. I think we in America as a civilization need to understand the barbaric nature of the enemy we are facing that's heading our way. Few people from my town, knowing what our fate was going to be, went to Israel, who was supposedly the enemy at the time. Israel was supposedly Lebanon's enemy, according to the government-controlled media. But we as Christians, our back was to the Jews, Israel. Our front was to the Palestinians and the Muslims. And we knew of the two evils, of the two devils, the Jews are not going to slaughter us because we had more shared values with them than we had with the radical Islamists and the Palestinians. Few people from my town went to Israel and begged for help. And Israel started coming in in the middle of the night from 1976 till 1978 bringing food for the children, blinking, bringing bomb shelters to the people who didn't have a bomb shelter, bringing blankets to the family, bringing medication, bringing food for the military, bringing ammunition to the Christians, and teaching them how to fight, taking them into Israel to be trained. Because the Christian Lebanese had college degrees, had education, they were not street gangs. And you can have all the college degrees on your wall behind you, your doctorates, your law degree, and everything else. It doesn't do you squat when you are faced with an enemy who believes that beheading you is an order from Allah. And this is how we stayed alive for another two years. Until 1978, one day one of our militia members, the Christian militia in the south, came to us and he said, I just want to let you know that tonight we're going to be attacked. And we may die because we had lost so many people and I don't think we can fight. And I just want to wish you a merciful death. And I remember dressing in my burial clothes at age 13 because I did not want to look ugly when I'm dead because I wanted to look pretty. And I remember putting on my Easter dress that my mother had made for me. And we had a two-hour ceasefire. And my mother was combing my long hair and tying a white ribbon in it that matched the white flowers in my dress.
one of the top enforcers of this politically correct driven fear is CARE, the Council on American Islamic Relations. For years, CARE had bullied, berated, intimidated, and smeared anyone who dared criticize radical Islam. For years, CARE has been the go-to organization for the media and our government. This in spite of its documented ties to Hamas and its long list of leaders and officials who have either been investigated, arrested, or convicted on terrorism-related charges. After Hassan's terror attack, CARE trotted out Executive Director Nihad Awad, who insisted that no religious faith could justify this attack. He insisted there was nothing in Islam that could justify this attack. He insisted this had nothing to do with Islam. Awad must have have missed the hundreds of passages in the Quran and Hadith that not only allow but exhort violence against the unbelievers. Passages such as Surah 9-5, fight and kill the disbelievers wherever you find them. Or Surah 8-12, smite them on their necks and every joint and incapacitate them, strike off their heads. Or Surah 9-123, Fight the unbelievers around you and let them find harshness in you. President Obama apparently missed those verses as well when he parroted CARE's talking points at the memorial service at Fort Hood on November 10th. Obama claimed no faith justifies these murderous and craven acts. The problem is hundreds of millions of Islamists around the world who follow their holy books and centuries of Islamic jurisprudence defiantly disagree. They proclaim for all the world to see that such acts of violence against the infidel are indeed justified and exhorted by Allah. Yet the power of political correctness in America is so strong that leaders in our military and our government arrogantly presume to tell Islamists of the world that they're reading their Qur'ans wrong, that they're wrong in following the military example of Muhammad, that they're wrong listening to their mullahs and imams who exhort them to kill and conquer the infidels in the world. This is nothing short of madness. A pandemic of political correctness has chained, blinded, and muted far too many of America's leaders. As a result, they do not confront the ugly forces of Islamist bigotry, hatred, intolerance, and violence. The Fort Hood terrorist attack is a direct tragic consequence of political correctness. I founded Act for America to give patriotic Americans like yourself a voice to combat radical Islam and the political correctness that is helping advance it. It is long past time we throw political correctness in the garbage where it belongs. If you agree with me, join us. If you are fed up, concerned, frightened, or angry at the state of political correctness in our country and the price we are paying for tolerating it, then join us. Go to actforamerica.org, sign our petition calling for a government investigation of care and its ties to terrorism. Sign up to receive our email alerts. Together, we will rise and demand that our leaders put our security and our liberties ahead of politically correct driven fear. Add your voice to ours. Become a voice affecting your community and our nation for the sake of our children and our country, and in the face of a growing torrent of hateful, invective, and terrorist murder, we must wake up and take action. The longer we lay supine, the more difficult it will be to stand erect. Join with me and almost 70,000 Act for America members, and let's draw a line in the sand and say, enough is enough. Go to actforamerica.org, sign our petition, and join us. Together, we can protect our nation. Thank you.